Welcome back from lunch. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, I'm Ethan Katz. I teach at UC Berkeley, and I'm honored and delighted to chair this session on Muslims in France across time and space. Uh, we are sorry that two of the original panelists could not be here, but we still have a great lineup, and the new configuration has also given us the opportunity to focus the panel chronologically on the pre-modern and early modern eras in a way that I actually think may be quite salient. Now, while I am rather unequivocally a modernist in my temporal orientation, I relate uh, at quite a visceral level to the conceit of this panel. That is, the idea that Muslims in French history can be found in numerous times and places where they have been neglected or ignored by historians until quite recently, and that in so doing, we will rethink, we will rethink major questions about not only the relationship of France to Muslims and Islam, and vice versa, but about the larger cultural, social, political, and intellectual histories we study in each era of what we now call French history. Some 17 years ago, when I started research for a dissertation on Muslims and Jews in 20th century France, even the notion that I would be studying Muslims and their social relationships in France in the early to mid 20th century, or really any time before the 1970s, was met repeatedly with quizzical or incredulous responses, including from a number of fellow French historians. Yet at about the same time, a major volume appeared, edited by Mohamed Arkoun, published by uh, Albert Michel on Islam and Muslims in French history from ancient to modern times. This reflected the beginnings of a shift that has now become a sea change. The work of the scholars on this panel both reflects and has done much to, to push forward that transformation in the scholarship on France and Islam and Muslims and France. And yet there's a significant gap that remains in public consciousness wherein a kind of often willful amnesia persists about the centuries of interconnectedness between Islamic religion and culture, Muslim individuals and groups, and entities, groups, individuals, and institutions of what we now call France and the Francophone world. All the work that we are hearing about today is in part meant to address that lack of consciousness, to bring much needed attention in public conversation and collective memory to what historians have been discovering and writing about now for well over a decade. In their opening remarks, our panelists will focus around a number of themes. They will address the importance of reinserting Muslims in the history of France, or what later became known as France, for the particular period they study, and what we miss if we fail to include Muslims there. They will also address questions of continuity and rupture. Can we speak about Muslims in or of France across disparate times and places, given the variations in what those terms have meant over time and territory? In the process, they will address in connection what, quote, Muslim meant in religious, cultural, ethnic, or racial terms for the period that they study. In a third theme, a number of scholars have recently pushed us to think about France as a, quote, Mediterranean space, including some of those on this panel. I've asked our panelists to think about the significance of this move for Muslims in French history and how thinking about the long durée history of Muslims works in conversation with resituating France as much in the Mediterranean as in Western Europe. Finally, one Mediterranean city that has loomed very large in most writings on Muslims in French history is Marseille, with its very long history as a port for transit and migration and crucial roles in the history of French empire, capital, commerce, and statecraft. Panelists will discuss how recentering French history from Paris to Marseille can enable us to write a history where Muslims figure differently and how that refiguring in turn may affect myriad larger issues in the period of France that they study. So I'm going to introduce uh, the panelists all together at the beginning here in just a moment, uh, and they will then speak in their opening remarks for about 10 minutes, and then we will open the floor for uh, questions and comments from the floor and uh, also among the panelists. Our first panelist uh, is Elizabeth Castine. Her research focuses on the history of gender and sexuality in the high and late Middle Ages. Her first book, From She-Wolf to Martyr, The Reign and Disputed Reputation of Johanna I of Naples, published by Cornell University Press in 2015, examines an infamous controversial woman who became Europe's first truly sovereign queen in the middle of the 14th century, using her constantly evolving reputation as a lens through which to assess later medieval conceptions of gender, sexuality, queenship, and sovereignty. Castine's current research research centers on the problem of raptus, a Latin term that could denote rape, but also, and sometimes simultaneously, theft, abduction, seizure, or mystical rapture. In medieval Western Europe, the ecstatic female saint was the object of raptus, but so were ens 
enslaved Muslim women who were often and explicitly subject to sexual coercion and elite women who were abducted and forced into marriage by fortune hunters. Castine's new book project examines Raptus in its divergent but overlapping senses and interrogates the ambivalence and ambiguity that continue to characterize discussions of sexual violence. At, she teaches at Binghamton University uh, SUNY uh, and at the graduate level she teaches seminars that focus on gender, spirituality, and medieval historiography. Her undergraduate courses focus on particularly the period between uh, 1000 and 1500 and cover such topics as the Crusades, women, gender, and sexuality in medieval Europe, and introductory surveys of both Western civilization and medieval European history. Our second speaker will be Jillian Weiss from Case Western, Uni Case Western Reserve University. Uh, Jillian is associate professor of history there, uh, and she's a scholar of France and the Mediterranean world during the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. She's the author of Captives and Corsairs, France and Slavery in the Early Modern Mediterranean, Stanford University Press 2011, translated into French in 2014, and with Meredith Martin of the forthcoming The Sun King at Sea, Maritime Art and Galley Slavery in Louis XIV's France. Uh, it'll be published by the Getty Research Institute. She also co-edited a special issue of French history with Megan Armstrong on France in the early modern Mediterranean in 2015, and is currently writing a book entitled The Money Launderer's Daughter, A Sephardic Woman and a Slave Rumor in the 17th Century Mediterranean. Our third speaker will be Junko Takeda, uh, who is professor of history and Dykoff faculty scholar in the Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs at Syracuse University. Her research and teaching interests focus on the histories of early modern globalization, state building and revolutions, migration, medicine, and disease. Her first book, Between Crown and Commerce, Marseille in the Early Modern Mediterranean, published by Johns Hopkins in 2011, explored the political tradition of civic republicanism in the context of French trade with the Ottoman Empire. Her second monograph, The Other Persian Letters, Iran and a French Empire of Trade, 1700 to 1808, published by Liverpool University Press, Oxford University Studies in the Enlightenment in 2020, examines commercial, industrial, and diplomatic exchanges between France and Iran in the long 18th century and highlights the importance of Asia in the Age of Revolutions. She is writing a third book, Avedik, Louis XIV's Armenian Prisoner, which is a global micro-history. It tells the story of an Armenian patriarch and his valet incarcerated at French island prisons in the Mediterranean, Atlantic, and Caribbean in the early 18th century. And our final, final presenter will be Ian Collar of the University of California at Irvine. Ian earned his PhD in history from the University of Melbourne uh, and is professor of history at Irvine, where he specializes in modern France, the French Revolution and Empire, modern Europe, and the Muslim Mediterranean. He was the recipient of an Australian Research Council postdoctoral fellowship from 2007 to 2011, and the AEUIFAI, quite an acronym, fellowship at the European University Institute in Florence in 2011. Thank you, Ian, for not making me say all the words in that acronym. Uh, Collar is the author of Muslims and Citizens, Islam, Politics, and the French Revolution from Yale University Press, published in 2020, uh, and Arab France, uh, Islam and the Making of Modern Europe, 1798 to 1831, uh, University of California Press, 2010, uh, winner of the W.K. Hancock Award of the Australian Historical Association, uh, as well as numerous articles and book chapters. So it's a wonderful panel of scholars, and I'm really looking forward to their discussion. Uh, let's welcome them. <laughs> Um, and my thanks as well to the Society for organizing this round table and for asking me to participate. I'm really looking forward to the conversation today. So I thought since I am going first and since I work the earliest of all of us, I would start just with the reminder of the complexity of Muslim-Christian relations in France, which goes back all the way to the very early history of Islam, and particularly for French history, significantly with the period of Muslim rule of the province of Narbonne, which would become Carolingian Septimania in 759. Recent work by archaeologists and scholars of material history, thinking about that Muslim period of rule in southern France, has done a lot to dismantle the sort of enduring Piran thesis which sees a civilizational clash between Christianity and Islam and sees the emergence of Islam as a point of rupture, the end of a unified Mediterranean Roman culture. And it is very clear now that that thesis is far too simplistic, that it ignores the complexity of the interconnectedness of the Christian and Muslim communities in southern France in particular. 
It's clear now that there was a great deal of communal integration, um, that even long after Charles Martel's victory in 759, whoops, I've gone too far. Okay, I lost the slide. Um, there was still a great deal of cultural exchange, there was trade, there was exchange of ideas, and that people across southern France continued to admire and to envy their Muslim neighbors long after the putative end of the Muslim period in southern France. Literary scholars have also pointed out that an enduring fascination with Islam and with Muslims is really foundational to French literature. This goes back as far as the Chanson de Roland, which of course is based in a far longer history than that. Um, Lynn Ramey has referred to the Chanson de Roland as the beginning of French literature and the beginning of the French nation, right? Which suggests that Frenchness and France were for a very long time defined with relation to Muslims and with relation to Islam. Um, for the medieval period, the French investment in Islam was obviously particularly marked during and by the period of crusading. There comes out of the text that we have from this period a sense of difference, but also of kinship, of both the understanding that Christianity and Islam are inimical to one another, but also that they are similar, and that there is the omnipresent possibility that they may become one community. Scholars have been particularly interested in how this comes out in high medieval French literature and things like romance, epic, chansons de geste, which tend to look at war between Christians and Muslims, but are also very interested in the possibilities of romance. And in fact, the trope of the Saracen princess who was converted to Christianity through her love of a Christian man is a staple of, um, of French literature. It's so common that Sharon Kinoshita has referred to this as the trope of conversion by seduction. In my own work, I'm actually particularly interested in the iteration of this, which we could call conversion by rape. Um, narratives in which a Muslim woman is raped and that rape precipitates her entry into the Christian community. Um, my entry point for a lot of the work I'm doing right now has been the Chanson de Geste of uh, Tristan de Nontoy, which begins with Tristan's rape of a Muslim princess named Blanchandine, a rape that precipitates Blanchandine's Christianization. And at the moment of the rape, Tristan is a wild man, but the rape civilizes him. And then later in the poem, Blanchandine is transformed into a man by an angel and proceeds to then go on and have sex with another Muslim princess who also becomes Christian and becomes the mother of a Christian saint. I think that that trope is one that we need to pay particular attention to given the way that French literature developed against a cultural backdrop and context of Mediterranean slavery. That the slavery of the Mediterranean world, as scholars are increasingly recognizing in Western Europe, um, was predominantly, at least until the 14th century, an enslavement of Muslims, and predominantly an enslavement of Muslim women in urban households, which means that it was also a slavery that was in important senses explicitly sexual and sexualized. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with this, there was a very active um, high and late medieval slave trade across the Mediterranean. Muslims were taken from Iberia into France. There was a sort of trading network with nodes at Perpignan, Narbonne, Montpellier, Marseille that was then connected to Italy and from there to the Black Sea. And that worked in reverse as well with Muslims often being transported from both Naples and Genoa into southern France where they were enslaved. The scholars have yet, I think, to really fully grapple with the sexual aspects of this particular enslavement. But medieval people tended to be aware of it. Um, the quote that I have on the screen, which is too long to read right now, is a quote from the revelations of the Swedish prophetess Brigitte of Sweden, who visited Naples in 1372 and was appalled by Naples' slavery. Not by the slavery itself, because slavery was an acceptable means towards conversion. Slavery was understood as one prong of crusading but that the slaves in Naples were not being converted and instead were being forced into sexual servitude and often into forcible prostitution. For my project, Naples is particularly important because it was the seat of an Angevin realm that included the county of Provence, which the rulers of Naples were counts of, and Naples and Marseille were very much entangled with one another and we know that many of the slaves in medieval Marseille came via Naples. This is something that is often not really fully recognized by scholars who work on Provençal history and on the history of the Languedoc. There has been an assumption that slavery cannot have had very much of a cultural impact because the numbers of the enslaved were relatively small, particularly if we compare to the cases of Iberia and Italy at the same period. I think there are a number of problems with that. Um, 
one thing I think is important to recognize is that slavery was countenanced by everybody in that society. It was licit, it was public, it was well known. Even people who did not own slaves encountered slaves on a regular basis and they upheld the idea of crusading as, or of slavery as an expression of crusading, as part of what they called a just war. And slavery tends to be justified with the language of just war. It's also clear, once you start digging into archival sources, that slavery was not just an elite phenomenon. That people who were enslaved in Marseille, in Montpellier, and other places were enslaved not just by elites, but also by craftsmen. So what I have on the screen is um, a deed of sale of a young woman named Margaret who was sold by one draper to another draper in the 1360s for a sum of money which is fairly large, but within the means of a craftsperson. And in fact, a lot of the evidence that I have found for slavery in Provence and the Languedoc suggests that slavery was something that was practiced by middling people, by craftspeople um, across the region. I've been working on and off for the last several years on a really interesting case that I think gives us a little bit of a sense of the ethos of slavery in medieval Marseille. Um, this is a case that came before the first court of appeals in 1407 and 1408 in which a woman named Magdalena, who had been born in North Africa, who appears to have been of Berber descent, was purchased in the port of Naples, so here, by a caulker from Marseille named Perugier, who took her from uh, Naples to Marseille and kept her as a slave for 10 years. Um, she then claimed to have been manumitted. Um, she became a Christian, she married, and she seems to have slipped fairly seamlessly into the urban fabric of Marseille where she was able to function very, very well as a member of Christian society until Pere sued her for theft of herself. In the course of the case, the two of them ruminate on the meanings of slavery in really interesting ways. It's clear that Magdalena values herself a great deal, that she sees herself as an important commodity, but also as free. While Pear and the men who come to testify for her, against her, make very clear that her slavery was sexual servitude. That she was used as a licit sexual object by them. They described their activity as part of a just war, despite the fact that Magdalena was clearly captured by raiders rather than in battle. Um, they see her slave status as permanent. They spend a great deal of time talking about the fact that she is African and therefore different, that she has um, scarification from burns on her arm which mark her as unchristian in ways that they see as insoluble, despite the fact that the women who testify on Magdalena's behalf see her as a Christian woman with honor, as a neighbor, as somebody who they admire and respect. So I've been thinking through the implications of that case and the different ways that the people in the community understand Magdalena and also thinking about how we understand her case against a cultural backdrop that sees the importance of you know, this idea of rape and romance as a means for conversion and as a prong of, um, of the crusading effort. So for Magdalena, we're thinking of a woman who was taken from somewhere probably in, in around Tunis, went from there to Naples and from Naples to Marseille. One of the things that strikes me about her case and about the other cases I've looked at is that it unfolds at the same time and in places where there were concerted efforts of moral reform. Um, both particularly in Perpignan and in Naples, there was an effort to cleanse the city center. So women who were professional prostitutes were forced to move to the edge of town. Those who wanted to remain in the center of the city had to become penitents and they had to enter into repentant convents which have cropped up across the Mediterranean during this period. Repentant convents were actually often in very close physical proximity to houses belonging to redemptive orders like the Mercedarians and the Trinitarians whose express purpose was to redeem Christian captives from servitude in Muslim lands. And I think that there is a clear connection between these, these different cultural products and thinking about the purity of a city center where there is no prostitution, where the crusading is central, where the religious heart of the city beats, but at the same time where there are homes where the same people who are patronizing re redemptive orders and penitent houses for prostitutes are also owning slaves. And we know that those slaves were frequently forced into concubinage or into prostitution. What that tells us about the moral topography and the sexual ethics of this period as these cities were beginning to develop a sense of communal identity. Um, this is perhaps particularly telling in the case of Naples and its connection to Marseille because Magdalena was purchased by Pear on a vessel that was in the port of Naples. She was displayed shackled as an object to be purchased for clearly sexual purposes. 
the port around her would have been off limits to Christian prostitutes who were considered a moral contaminant. Um, there were two repentant convents sitting and facing her across the port, and she was in what was supposed to be the moral heart of a moral city, and yet one that countenanced the enslavement of Muslim women as an expression of Christian dominance. And so I want to think through what that tells us about this period and about a developing sexual ethics. And I will stop there and hopefully talk more in questions. Um, thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be here. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here with all these um, great scholars of uh, Muslims in France across time and space, um, and also to see some familiar faces in the audience as well who um, have had a lot of influence on my work. Uh, so I've been uh, you know, thinking about Muslims for a very long time. Uh, I originally thought I would write my dissertation about Moriscos uh, that are uh, Iberian Muslims converted to uh, Catholicism, uh, the 50,000 of them that crossed over the Pyrenees uh, into France in 1610. And it was actually while doing some preliminary archival research about the Moriscos that I stumbled upon the phenomenon of Mediterranean slavery, um, and which is a subject that's been uh, captivating me uh, ever since, one way or the other. And I've also been um, studying the enslavement of Muslims on the galleys of Louis XIV for quite some time. Uh, for the past decade, I've been collaborating with an art historian uh, named Meredith Martin um, on um, examining the visual representations of Muslims on the galleys. Um, and our book, The Sun King at Sea, whose um, uh, cover you uh, see on the screen, actually came out in January. Um, and I'd like to spend a few minutes um, explaining how we came to the topic and what we discovered. Um, but the long and the short of it um, for this panel is that we found uh, Muslims in early modern France uh, hiding in plain sight. Um, that it was the combination of archival and visual sleuthing that allowed us to see, um, you know, see uh, this kind of phenomenon that was otherwise uh, overlooked. And, um, and finally, um, that the enslavement of Muslims, as well as Mediterranean affairs in the Mediterranean um, more generally and coming out of its major port of Marseille, were much more important to uh, Louis XIV than scholars have previously understood. Um, and that acknowledging their enslavement um, and their representation necessarily changes the way we think about the history of France. So, Okay, let's see if I can do this. Oops, there we go. Okay, so about 10 years ago, um, my co-author Meredith, uh, who is already a friend, sent me uh, an image, uh, the one on, uh, the far, on the right for you, um, with a painting from the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Um, and she'd come upon it while preparing a lecture um, for undergraduates about Versailles. And she could tell it was some sort of port scene that um, you have an image of Louis XIV, who, you know, there's ships in the background, and he is holding down um, some three chained, uh, dark skinned uh, figures with turbans. And I hadn't um, been familiar with this painting either, um, but I had already been working in the French archives um, uncovering um, a category of galley slaves, um, presumed to be Muslim, um, and referred to as esclave turc, or enslaved Turks, um, and more commonly known as Turks, even though most of them weren't actually Turkish, um, but hailed from Morocco, as well as from Ottoman territories in um, North Africa, in Asia, as well as in Europe. Up. And during the reign of Louis XIV, thousands of these Turks were captured and purchased for a new galley fleet that the Sun King had established in Marseille as a way of combating um, pirates and um, dominating trade in the Mediterranean, while also promoting himself as a global conqueror in the mold of Christian um, medieval crusaders and ancient rulers like Caesar. And you can see even in this painting that he is dressed as a uh, conqueror. And this particular 
medallion, uh, which was uh, painted by the, uh, the king's chief uh, painter, Charles Le Grand, uh, depicts the quote-unquote reestablishment of navigation in 1663 after the monarchy supposedly cleansed the Mediterranean Sea of infidel corsairs. And what we discovered once we started looking a little bit further is that although the subject of this medallion might have been hiding in plain sight, the act of subjugation and of enslavement that it depicts was not concealed, uh, nor was it particularly, nor was it just hidden in archives, but it was widely celebrated during the reign of Louis XIV. And it was visualized not only on palace walls, but in, um, but it was also touted in a range of um, artistic media, uh, it notes, notably in almanac prints and in royal medals. So the almanac print on the left uh, celebrates uh, one of three bombardment campaigns of France uh, carried out against Algiers in the 1680s. And the medal on the right commemorates the Sun King's achievement of building 40 galleys um, powered by some 10,000 galley slaves, um, comprising about 8,000 convicts, some of whom were um, condemned for the crime of heresy of being Protestant, um, but about 2,000 of them were enslaved Turks. And the presence of these enslaved Turks was also figured in several um, examples of maritime art, um, including the king's flagship that was known as the Royal Louis, um, which was also designed by Charles Le Brun. And its depiction of a Turk with a characteristic top knot, you can see it in the blow up um, on the right um, of Louis XIV. Um, it has a, a, a top knot um, which invoked the practice of real live enslavement that many scholars have missed um, by reading this kind of vignette as an allegorical si symbol instead um, of actually um, a representation of a real pe person. And our book actually manages to identify actual Muslim galley slaves who might have even posed for this kind of imagery, uh, including two men, one named Condi and the other Mustafa, who were brought to Paris and forced to model for Le Brun um, and other artists at the Royal Academy. Um, they actually uh, seem to have become manservants for Colbert, uh, which means that they fared somewhat better than the preponderance of um, galley slaves who were sent on naval campaigns and then were forced to labor in port during the winter months. Based on uh, documentary evidence, uh, we know that some of the enslaved Turks working in Marseille and in the arsenal helped to construct and also to decorate the ships that they rode. Um, others worked in portside studios for um, royal artists like Pierre Puget, who relied on the labor of convicts and also of enslaved Turks to com uh, complete um, marble sculptures like the one um, on your left, which were brought to Versailles. Um, and he and his uh, colleague Jean Bobé also likely had galley slaves posed for them um, as live models for artworks like this um, cannon, which um, had, that is um, decorated with the head of a Turk. Um, the cascabel is the knob of a cannon that was used to tie the, the gun onto the deck of the ship so that it, then it was fired, it didn't recoil and go into the sea. And if you look closely, you can sort of still see um, the rope marks around the neck, which you know only um, serve to emphasize you know, the physical suffering um, that you already see in his strained uh, face and body. So the you know, essential point that we make of the Sun King at Sea is that both um, artists and images of enslaved Turks circulated between coast and capital during the reign of Louis XIV, but that also actual enslaved rowers were present at Versailles um, as well. And so in 1680, for example, um, the Crown purchased 45 enslaved men to row on a model, a model galley um, that was um, 
part of an entire miniature flotilla um, on the Grand Canal at, um, at Versailles. Um, they were forced to perform in masquerades and festivals. And in addition, some of them may have posed uh, for portraits uh, and fashion prints featuring royal women with their enslaved attendants. And usually this kind of imagery um, is thought to be connected to the phenomenon of transatlantic slavery. But we argue that it's likely uh, that at least some of these portraits from the 17th century uh, tend to um, evoke Mediterranean enslavement um, and might have something to do with the ability of of these um, women to convert their attendants from um, Islam. Another um, kind of material that we look at are um, a bunch of illustrated manuals um, that were made by naval officers in Marseille near the end of the 17th century. And they um, made them as part of an effort to um, argue for the importance of continuing to enslave Muslims at a time that the phenomenon was actually trying to, um, was, was starting to decrease. Um, and so the images like this one, this cartouche um, on the right, uh, you can see see um, an argument about, um, a visual argument about France's um, sea power depending on harnessing the power of supposedly uh, superior uh, strength of enslaved Turks. Um, and they also um, emphasize a kind of compensatory violence that might have been uh, related to the demoted status of the naval officers uh, who made them. And we can see this kind of violence in this aerial view from the same manual that shows enslaved rowers um, cramped together five to a bench um, along with whip-bearing seamen. And you might notice that this image bears a striking resemblance uh, to the famous image of the Brooks slave ship, which was later repurposed by um, abolitionists as an icon of human suffering. Um, so, but, the, but one of the things that we're arguing is that, in fact, this earlier galley image um, conveys no such critical message, but rather it celebrates power and violence and mastery uh, and tries to um, elicit a similar feelings um, in its viewer. Um, the last um, chapter, and I'm just going to very briefly show you, show you these pictures because I don't want to um, uh, dwell on them, um, that we talk about um, and where enslaved Turks uh, show up is in these monumental canvases that were made uh, depicting um, the Great Plague of Marseille in 1720. Um, and I can talk more about that um, you know, in the question and answer if we want. Um, but I just want to um, you know, stop now and just say, um, you know, why is it uh, that the kind of material that we gathered, um, why has it been so much overlooked? in both of these fields of history and art history. And I think that um, among art historians, there's probably three factors um, that account for it. Um, one has been a tendency to give more attention to uh, the center than the periphery, um, even though the Mediterranean, as we argue, is was pretty important and central to shaping the Sun King's image um, um, and was even on view in Paris and um, Versailles. Uh, second is the fact that maritime art in a lar large way um, often is ephemeral. It doesn't survive. Um, and the third is that um, in art history, the sort of global turn has tended to focus more on elite passengers as well as the luxury goods that were transported by the sea rather than the ships themselves or um, their you know, multi-ethnic personnel. And these kinds of accounts tend to emphasize and even romanticize the sort of free-floating uh, mobility of elite people and things at the expense of the labor and the violence uh, that made it um, possible. Um, and I think among historians, um, it has to do with the early modern legal maxim, um, there, were, you know, there are no slaves in France, um, reflecting the principle that any enslaved man or woman who stepped foot in French territory would be set free. And what this meant was that you know, slavery could exist in the uh, colonies, but not in the metropole. As we know from Sue Peabody's work and the you know, magnificent film on Fursi that we saw last night, um, this principle was successfully invoked by um, individuals, in, particularly in the late 18th century um, and early 19th century. But the phenomenon of galley slavery in the Mediterranean clearly gives a lie to the free soil principle, at least during the reign of Louis XIV. 
So just to say in conclusion, I mean, I think that we couldn't have done this book independently, that it required you know, someone trained in doing visual analysis with someone trained in doing archival uh, research to put these two things in conversation and sort of be able to see um, phenomenon um, more clearly that we couldn't have figured out on our own. But I would also say just finally that the stakes of doing of recovering this kind of history are pretty clear. Um, one, that it challenges um, a, an idea of metropolitan France as a land of liberty. Um, it forces us to acknowledge the forced labor of people who did not benefit from the kingdom's um, free soil principle. Um, it shifts our understanding um, about the relationship between center and periphery and just demonstrates the ways in which the Mediterranean influenced the conceptualizations of France. And finally, and most obviously, I guess, it undermines assumptions that Muslim contributions or threats, depending on your perspective, to the identity of France date to the 20th century following the decolonization of Algeria. Um, and I'll just end with this last um, image, you know, which sort of points up, um, you know, I think some of the payoff of our collaboration. And this is, you know, this image, the top down aerial view of a galley alongside a page from a inventory of enslaved Turks who were incorporated into the galleys in Marseille. Thank you. So thank you so much to everyone for coming today. Um, I'd like to thank Ethan and the panel program committee for including um, this fruitful discussion on, uh, on Muslims in France across space and time. So my research focuses on French commercial engagement with and within Muslim empires across the long 18th century. So I'm going to be talking just very briefly about my first um, book and then spend the majority of um, this brief talk talking about the second. So my first, Between Crown and Commerce, explored the central role that Marseille and its merchants played in developing exchanges between Bourbon France and Ottoman Turkey, and the inclusion of Marseille and the Ottomans into the story of French statecraft and commerce allows us to complicate our understanding of absolutism and whether Paris or Versailles were, central, uh, were centers to Mediterranean peripheries or the other way around. I opened that book with the conquest of 1660 when Louis XIV subdued a stubbornly independent former republic and harnessed it to Controller General Jean-Baptiste Colbert's project to resuscitate France's Levant trade. Marseille's monopoly in Mediterranean maritime trading was critical, I argue, to the city becoming administratively integrated and incorporated into the kingdom. I anchored my study at Marseille to demonstrate that processes that we understand as French statecraft in the period, like bureaucratic centralization or colbertisme, while imposed from above, were developed in conversation and through compromises and contestation with municipal mediators. Local merchants and bankers spent years consolidating their networks in Ottoman cities and possessed more expertise on or granular connections with Muslim empires than the French crown. And like Gillian's book, the book ended with a discussion of the Great Plague of 1720. And I show that even during medical catastrophe in the Mediterranean environment in which Marseille was embedded, it continued to serve as a laboratory for the expression of the city's unique Republican identity. So my second book, Iran in a French Empire of Trade, also explored French statecraft from the vantage point of the Mediterranean and Western Asia. If the study and history of French engagement with Muslims before 1830 especially was, has been relatively invisible, I think this is particularly the case with empires farther east from France than Ottoman Turkey, like the Persian Shiite and Omani Yoruba Ibadi empires. And I think the absence of French territorial domination or settler colonialism in the 19th century sense of the term in the places or geographic spaces that I study have generated an assumption that we can't talk about empire or French imp imperialism therein. 
but understanding imperialism to include contests over trade privileges, arms dealing, or commodity access, I, I describe French, quote, entrepreneurial imperialism in Persia, while others like Elizabeth Cross have recently discussed informal empire building in the Indian Ocean world and Asian subcontinent. So I think these flexible definitions allow France's global connections in pre-modernity, especially in the Indian Ocean and Mediterranean worlds, more visibility. So it's with, it's with that kind of global um, framework in mind that I wrote Iran and a French Empire of Trade. While Persia's adjacent bodies of water are the Caspian and Persian Gulf, it's not on the Mediterranean, um, my previous work taught me that conversations about how best to use Mediterranean sea lanes to disrupt Dutch and English trade or cultivate France's influence abroad or locate cheaper textiles or raw materials repeatedly raised the question of whether Persia's Safavids, Zans, and Hajars would be more reliable partners for the Bourbon monarchy and protector of, of merchants and missionaries than the Ottomans. So Mediterranean maritime activity, I argue, was not sealed off from Eurasian inland trade or the Asia trade in the Indian Ocean. Some of Marseille's merchants in the Levant were the first to raise the possibility of direct trade with Persia in the late 17th century. Now, if they were to conclude a treaty with the Persians, such a treaty with the Turks' adversary could disturb the long alliance between the French and Ottomans. But I, I look at various lobbyists, like Catholic missionaries, who believe that Persia's Shia population and their Armenian and Georgian Christian subjects were more amenable to, uh, to Catholic proselytizing. It's something that Susan McVeary has also shown. Um, I also look at local entrepreneurs frustrated with Ottoman taxes on Persian, Persian uh, Armenian silks. And these people started to nudge the French crown to support their overtures to various shahs. So the first half of the book um, basically are a collection of micro histories and they trace some unlikely characters' involvement in initiating Franco-Persian relations. I look at a well-connected but bankrupt silk trader from Marseille, Jean-Baptiste Fabre, and his creditor, Marie Petit, who's often denigrated as his concubine, but was in fact his creditor, uh, a Marseillaise drug peddler and traveler beyond the Cancerie, a diplomatic secretary turned ambassador, Pierre-Victor Michel, these are a, a few figures, and these, uh, these individuals cultivated relations with Persian-Armenian go-betweens, Georgian vassal princes, and regional khans to navigate around the Dutch and English already established in Persia. After Michel's treaty with Shah Sultan Hussein in 1708, Mohammed Reza Beg's embassy to Versailles led to its ratification in 1715. It's super dark in this image, but here at the top you see Louis XIV receiving Reza Beg in 1715. His Armenian gift bearer, Hagopian, was installed at Marseille as Persia's first consul to France. And Reza Beg's translator, a Greek drogmand turned naturalized, turned French consul at Shiraz, Etienne Paderi, advanced a secret arms deal to help the Safavids contain revolts among tributary populations and incursions by the Russians. He also planned a French invasion of Muscat to help the Persians neutralize Omani threats in the Gulf. So I think these negotiations reveal that the term Muslim fails to capture the complexity of the cast of characters, their ethnic identities and confessional politics in Franco-Persian trade. And I would, uh, I would add here also that exploring the French engagement with Muslims, with Armenians, Georgians, and also Indian merchants allows us to understand how race-making um, and race categorizations operated in early modern France. It's a really interesting time period in the late 17th century, early 18th, where you see various vocabularies of race coexisting. One where you find them arguing about certain immutable traits that Asians, um, including the Armenians and Muslims there, have, while there are also conversations about how there are traits that are conditioned by religion and by environment. And these two kinds of arguments are co coexisting and changing. Now all the plans that I talk about in the first half of my book with these micro-histories collapsed as untimely contingencies ushered in decades of Persian civil wars, but I argue that they're historically important for two reasons. 
First, they found renewed relevance between the Seven Years' War and Napoleonic Wars as various French regimes dealt weapons in Western Asia and instigated Turkish, uh, uh, Russo-Turkish and Persian Wars in an effort to locate new markets and replace lost Caribbean revenues with North African and Asian trade. Second, the political perturbances transforming Eurasian empires across the 18th century, something that historians traditionally understood and labeled as the fall or the decline of gunpowder empires, I argue shaped revolutionary ideas and practices, and practices in France across the latter half of the 18th century and into the 19th. So to, to illustrate the central book uh, point in my book, I want to talk briefly about Persian revolutions in the age of revolutions. And I have this image here of Napoleon, um, which I'll come to in a few minutes. But you can see here, if you can see better, what you would see is Reza Beg in 1708. And then you see Kazvani in 18, in the, um, sorry, in the early 19th century, about a century apart, but they're wearing the same robe. And you can clearly see, and, and the pose is also very similar, right? He's bowing um, to Napoleon in a way similar to Louis XIV. So he's kind of trying to outdo Louis um, a century later. So Persian revolutions in the age of revolutions. Um, in 1721, uh, as Montesquieu published his Persian letters, the Afghan chief Mahmoud Hotak besieged Isfahan and forced the collapse of the Safavid, Safavid dynasty. Consuls from France noted, uh, quote, we've never seen revolutions so great in Persia as those today. So they're referring to these perturbances as revolutions. In France, Mahmoud's advances in Russian expansion into Persia topped the Gazette's May 1722 issue and the Mercure's headlines between 1722 and 1723. You see that at the top right there. Mahmoud's short rule was followed eventually by the longer reign of Nader Shah, who claimed the throne, invaded India, and garnered fame as the period's most formidable conqueror. Commentaries by French um, individuals on revolutions that they witnessed in Persia informed policymakers and literary audiences about the political earthquakes transforming Eurasian empires. And as they did, the term revolution evolved from a word used to describe political upheavals to one connected to political regeneration. This is something that domestically Keith Baker and others have talked about, this transformation in the use of the word uh, revolution, and I'd like to use it to talk about the ways in which uh, revolution was understood on a more global scale. The usage of revolution connected to political regeneration, I find in discussions about Nader Shah. The Mercure de France, uh, November 1731 uh, issue, introduced him as a warrior savior, excusing his atrocities and conquest of India. Authors pit the strong man's masculine power against the effeminacy typically ascribed to oriental despots. In Histoire de Thomas Kulikan, Roi de Perse, from 1743, and uh, Kulikan is the other name for Nader Shah, André de Clostre noted how Nader declined the throne until he, quote, convoked the estates general to freely elect him king. Louis Chevalier de Jocor, who qualified Nader as a usurper in the Encyclopédie, still admired the ambition and courage of an extraordinary man. So they see him as a revolutionary hero who, after years of civil war, is trying to regenerate uh, France through the use of imperial expansion. And this is something that I argue uh, that uh, Napoleon picked up um, a few decades later, and he was an avid reader of these, of these texts. That gendered appraisals of Nader captivated French audiences as Louis XV lost France's Atlantic colonies and Louis XVI struggled to produce an heir may be more than a coincidence. These writings also impacted France's interventionist policies after the Seven Years' War. Louis XV's foreign minister, the Duc de Choiseul, the Secretary of State for the Navy, the Duc de Praslin, looked around the Mediterranean to instigate proxy wars, deal arms, and replace lost Caribbean revenues with African and Asian trade. They dispatched France's trade commissioner in Baghdad, Jean-Francois Rousseau, who incidentally is first cousin on, of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, to Shah Karim Khan Zand in 1768 to boost trade in the Persian Gulf. 
Jean-Francois Rousseau was born in Isfahan in 1738, and he was actually the son of uh, Jacques Rousseau, who was the chief jeweler for both Sultan Hussein and Nader Shah. Jean-Francois devoted his life to planning a French-Persian invasion of India, which he marketed uh, to Napoleon at the turn of the century. Fantasizing becoming emperor in Asia on the centenary of Michel's treaty with Sultan Hussein, Napoleon tried to out Louis Louis by corresponding with Persia's Hajar Shah Fatali, promising aid against Russia in exchange for a joint assault on the subcontinent. His and Fatali's conquest of India, which he argued would, quote, harness the Orient's courage and genius to Western military arts, would represent the culmination of the French Revolution and Nader's Revolution. And the two documents I have there are um, Napoleon's letters to Fatali, basically claiming that he's his brother and together that they can drive out the British from India and liberate the Indians from British despotism uh, and then basically become brothers as joint masters of Asia. Rousseau and his son Joseph submitted a tableau général de la Perse to Talleyrand, outlining the plans for the French to march on Delhi with Persians, Afghans, and Sikhs. Now, after signing the uh, Franco-Persian Treaty of Finkenstein in 1807, pictured here again, Napoleon abandoned Fatali. But all of these abortive um, missions in the French Revolution in India with Persia that never happened provides important lessons. The Enlightenment's Republic of Letters linked observations from Persia to audiences in France and stressed the relationship between revolutionary regeneration and imperial expansion. Policymakers realized that Persia's domestic turmoil and Nader's conquest of India molded a favorable environment for European conquerors, diplomats, and merchants to cut their imperial teeth. Islamic empires' roles in shaping European revolutions have been traditionally left out of studies about the age of revolutions. But I argue that if we draw more connections between Asian and Atlantic worlds, we can identify continuities across the revolutionary divide. We can work to correct the relative invisibility of Asians and Asia in French history in general and rethink our whitewashed myths about the making of modernity. In, in, in joining this wonderful panel, and I really thank uh, Christine and Trish and Rick and others who, who, who proposed this panel, which was originally titled uh, Muslims in France Across Time and Space. Um, it's exciting for me to be coming last rather than to be coming first, and that actually has been a dream for some time that we would actually be talking about uh, early modern France and to, to be, you know, having this uh, wonderful uh, st stretching between the medieval and uh, the kind of revolutionary and immediately post-revolutionary period is really exciting. I guess I want to um, just say a few things rather than go really heavily uh, into the details of my work. I want to say a few things about what connections this has to the present, just because I think that is, you know, a concern uh, that people have, and what it what what it is at least for me that I think that I am doing and have been doing for pretty long time now uh, in thinking about these questions, and really inspired too by the plenary that we just uh, attended on uh, Black women in French history, which I think you know just reminds me of the kind of real importance to be thinking about our positioning as historians and who is uh, who is included, who is welcomed into French history to speak, um, whose butts are in the room, as it was put, uh, and, and whose are not. So um, the titles of my books, I guess, tell you something about the way I've been thinking about this. Uh, Arab France was the first one. Muslims and Citizens is the more recent one. Um, and in each of the titles there is a dyad uh, in which the first term uh, I guess uh, is asking really whose history this is who does this history belong to um, but the second term is also asking what France means what the citizen means uh, when placed in this unfamiliar and uncomfortable intimacy <laughs> with terms which are not usually uh, coupled together. So I think that in 
you know what is what is interesting to me and what has been so wonderful about hearing these papers is is the interrogating of the self-evidence of France and of Frenchness across time and in space um, the deconstructing and reconceiving of France as an ongoing and unfinished process rather than a fixed point or an inevitable passion uh, passage towards some uh, kind of nation state some perfect perfect nation state and that, I think, really allows us to enrich the plurality of pasts and thereby understand the present differently. And, but I also believe very strongly in its possibility to liberate other and possibly more inclusive futures. Um, and for me, this reconception of France is not just about diversity, even if a colleague in France accused me of trying to write a roman national de la diversité to replace the French national narrative. Not so bad, but anyway. Um, it's also about, and I, I guess where I would maybe push back, is that I think it's also about decoloniality. Um, because, you know, this work does work to present, to make present the colonial frames within which France emerged. And I think a decolonial perspective doesn't just refer to the modern period. It can also accommodate a series of other relationships of power, dependency, sovereignty, entanglement that traverse this process uh, of constructing France. Um, and I think in this sense, it's possible to decolonize our understanding of the pre-modern French past. And I think that is partly <laughs> what we're doing on this panel. Um, and thinking about Muslims is really important because it, as we've seen, take, takes this questioning much further into the French pre-colonial past and interrogates the way that the colonial is imagined as a discrete period of history. You know, people like Todd Shepard have, have, have questioned that idea of, 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 of decolonization, right? Um, but we still, I think, have that sense of a kind of, you know, the colonialism starts at some, some point. Um, rather than thinking of this as we have today, uh, as a co-constructor of France itself, that these that these relations exist in some sense before France exists, right? Islam was central to France's claims to colonial empire, that much is evident, and it continues today to frame the French claims to a civilizing mission in the global sense, right? I was just talking this week to, to, to African uh, colleagues who were just talking to me about the power of that of that ongoing civilizing mission of France um, through language in particular. But it's my sense that the French Islamophobia of which we're all so aware today is not simply as it is sometimes explained an extension of anti-clerical secularism but is entwined with much more complex processes, including French Islamophilia and other political and religious uses of Islam um, and a set of relationships that accompany the economic and cultural relationships stretching back across the construction of France. And that's really what brought me to think about the French Revolution, which has been almost constitutively conceived without Muslims and Islam. Um, this, the, the French Revolution, as we all know, um, we've had plenty of panels on it and we'll have plenty of panels on it uh, in, in this conference. Um, it's the crucial hinge that defines the French exception, but at the same time articulates France's exceptional place in the framing of a political modernity essentially conceived as European or Western. And in this sense, it is the key to, although not the source of, France's ongoing civilizing mission. And I, you know, I think it's shared across the political spectrum from what I see in France today, whether it's you know, Macron or Zemmour or uh, others, um, even if with differing degrees of authoritarianism. Um, it has been necessary to assert the Frenchness of the French Revolution, not only in France, but even among Anglophones who subscribe in some sense to that traditional and conservative vision of France and its place in the world, which is part of our profession. I mean, it's part of what makes our profession. 
What I found in my historical research is that revolutionary, revolutionaries themselves, as my colleagues here have pointed out in, in their respective periods, did not think in this way and did not cleave in the same way to the sense of a f fixed Frenchness. The revolution was always in complex relationships to its precursor, adjacent component revolutions and counter-revolutions, whether in Alsace, Avignon, the anti-Corsica, uh, Nice, Liège, Brabant, Mans, America, Island, India, or in the Echelle du Levant et de Barbarie, the fragments of French sovereignty in the Ottoman Empire. And revolutionaries were fascinated by Muslims as the test case for the uh, universalism of the revolution. So that just really takes me to just a few quick images that I want to show you. You can see the images from the French Revolution here. It will just give you some kind of flavor of the ways in which uh, revolutionaries used Muslims and Islam to articulate their kind of political visions. In the book, I was interested equally in the ways in which Muslims themselves negotiated those, uh, those representations, how they found ways of articulating their own political uh, participation in the revolution. Um, so you see here, I mean, this, this gives you some sense of the very early conceptions of Muslims in the revolution, and this is a kind of allegorical image of uh, the, uh, the revolution of 1789, um, and the kind of de-despotization of the French monarchy, right? This is, those of you who know something about that early period of the revolution will know that, you know, it starts off as a kind of aristocratic challenge against uh, the what they see as the despotism of the monarchy, but is kind of infused with a new kind of uh, uh, popular challenge uh, and a conception of popular sovereignty. But this is an attempt, and I think a you know, kind of uncomfortable attempt to kind of settle and stabilize the meanings of the revolution. And you see here this quite violent image, and this goes back to, uh, to, to Gillian's work, right, on, 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 on enslaved Muslims, right? This is the chasing out of these despotic Muslims who are also slaves because they have, they have the manacles there with them, right? Um, we then kind of move on to the Muslim as test case for the for the global universalism of the of the revolution, and this is this is an image of the revolutionary calendar that includes the the, the Englishmen and the Frenchmen embracing, but they are showing this new uh, this new revolutionary ambition to two Muslims, right, a Turk and an Indian, as you see there. Then then you see like very differently. This is this is from the the. the the promulgation of the Constitution, the, the development of the Constitution in 1791-1792, and the massive uh, religious schism that is happening in France. And it is no coincidence here that we see an Englishman showing a Turk, a Muslim, the idea of freedom. It's all explained in the in the caption below. While um, while we see uh, a priest, a friendly priest, trying to explain to ordinary French peasants why the, the, the Pope's condemnation of the French Revolution does not therefore mean that they should reject uh, the revolution, right? Um, and I just, lastly, this is, this is an image that takes us far forward from these, these struggles of the, of, the, of the revolution itself to the, to, the, to the Napoleonic period and to the end of the Napoleonic period that I've just been writing more about. And this takes me back to the um, subjects of my first book. Um, and we see the ways in which here the despotism of Napoleon, <laughs> the authoritarianism of Napoleon is being conceived through this, this connection between kind of revolutionary radicalism and Islam. And we get the beginnings, I think, there of, you know, these are the ingredients of contemporary French Islamophobia, and I think you can see them, you know, this, this, this projection of French authoritarianism onto Islam. Um, so I'll leave it there and we can talk more. I'd be happy to answer any, any questions that you might have. 
Iceland became uh, number one uh, enemy in the French uh, territory, and, and you pointed out uh, uh, that uh, you know French Revolution and colonization um, uh, has uh, contributed to these uh, to these uh, change. Um, uh, I don't know if you guys know Pascal Blanchard, yes, French uh, historian. Well, he, he said, and I'm still fascinated that uh, there's no Muslim, uh, museum of colonization in France. So he, he, he really uh, says a lot about uh, you know devoir de mémoire of uh, uh, the duty of uh, of memory of past memory. So uh, uh, until this time, uh, I don't know if, if there's going to be a change or if uh, the history uh, repeats itself. Uh, uh, are we going back to the great civilization one day? So I don't know. I don't have a you know, specific question, but I, I, I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, uh, interested in the image of, uh, of Islam, of Muslim, uh, that, has, that is now a race rather than a religion. And Pascal Blanchard uh, pointed out an other historian, I'm sure. Uh, so yeah, no, no, no question, maybe just like a comment. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone want to respond to that? No, absolutely. I think that's that. I mean, this is absolutely crucial, and you are absolutely right. I mean, and look, this is a very powerful French topos. The idea of we love Islamic civilization, but we don't really like Muslims, right? Um, but that hasn't always been the case. And I guess one of the things that we're trying to do here is to break up that sense that there is one French relationship to Islam, even if there are genealogies of these ideas that we need to understand in order to, I think, take them apart and question them, interrogate them. Um, but certainly in, during the French Revolution, you know, Mus it was Muslims. It was Muslims, and this is a, a point, I guess, the, 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 I mean, and this is where questions of Jews and Muslims together is very, very important, right? Um, people often quote, including, I think, Zemmour himself, quoting uh, the, the, the so-called dictum of the, the Comte de Clermont-Tonnerre saying that to, to the Jews as a nation, nothing to the Jews as individuals, everything, right? Um, which is, Maurice Samuel has effectively kind of argue that that's, you know, there's an incorrect interpretation of what that meant. And really that the revolution was saying, right, okay, you can't be a corporation, you're not a nation. Not that the Jews necessarily asked to be a nation. This was something to do with the kind of religious exclusion and excluding Protestants and, but not wanting the Jews to leave with all the money, basically, right? Um, and so giving them lettre patente as, as foreign nations within France. So that's not allowed, but uh, it wasn't saying, but you can't be Jews, right? It wasn't saying you, it was, in fact, it was the opposite. It's saying you, you need to be Jews because we need to prove the universalism of the revolution. And I saw this with Muslims too, right? The revolutionaries are saying Muslims need to be revolutionaries too. The question is how, right? And that's a really complicated question. But I guess the point is to just just to kind of break down this self-evidence that this is the this is the logic of French history. Hi, um, I'm Sung Choi. I'm uh, at Bentley University outside of Boston, and um, I didn't know what this plenary session was actually going to be about because the title was very brief and. I don't think it does justice to the richness of all that I heard um, from all of you. A lot of it is, is completely new to me. And I wanted to ask, um, I guess this can be asked of all four of you, because when I thought, um, you know, Islamic world and France interaction, the first thing that came to my mind was the Mediterranean a la Brodel. You know, this is the world that we're used to have read, uh, read reading. Um, and that sort of 1950s t story of trade and commerce and interaction was, was not here. And what I'm seeing rather is this enslavement one um, uh, kind of when, when we moved to Junko, Takeda's presentation had a lot to do with the uh, Asian world and the diplomatic interaction. 
so could you speak a little to um, how you read the Brodellian model in your own historiographical research and also as we're seeing these different encounters that you're presenting is there a sort of meta narrative we can get at here with Islamic world and, and France if there is any or, or do you reject that meta narrative picture I, I was wondering what your thoughts were on that should I start and we'll, we'll go chronologically again? So I, I think for, for scholars of the medieval Mediterranean, um, the, the Brodel model holds in a lot of ways, right? That we are very invested in the idea of a Mediterranean system, of the idea of an interconnected Mediterranean where exchange of all sorts is constantly happening and where in a lot of ways the Mediterranean matters more than the hinterland and sort of giving coherence to that. Um, I think the, the problem with Brodel is he's so zoomed out, right, in that it falls apart as you get closer. So what interests me is when I'm looking at medieval Marseille, one of the things that really strikes me about the case of, of Magdalena, the woman I spoke about, is that the way in which she is able to disappear into Marseille, the way that she's able to be part of the, the broader community, that there are these people who come to her defense, suggests to me that medieval Marseille looked like modern Marseille in a lot of ways. Right? They, we are looking at a Marseille that is already diverse, polyglot, inter-ethnic, inter-religious in ways that I find really fascinating and exciting, but that I think is coexisting with this other narrative that is really invested in the idea of, it's not necessarily French superiority, because people in Marseille are not thinking of themselves as French, but of Christian superiority, the superiority of the Latin world, which is being enacted on the bodies of Muslim women in ways that I think are very conscious and very public. And there is that push and pull between envy and fascination and the sense of, of connection, right? You know, this is the crusading world. It's only relatively recently that they've lost the Latin East. People in southern France and in Italy are fascinated with the idea of footholds in North Africa, right? So they, they are thinking in the Mediterranean way, but they are simultaneously thinking about a clash between religions that is so threatening because the religions are in fact so similar. So there's, there's a lot of tension there that I find really interesting. I don't know how much that answers your question. But I think that there, there are things of the Brodel model that hold, but then there is complexity that it erases. Do you want to take a stab at the second question also? Remind me what the second question was. Uh, is, is it worth thinking about a, a sort of a new meta narrative of Muslims in French history? Do you have thoughts about that? Like how that meta narrative would look, or is it just the wrong model? That, I hope I got the question yeah. right. <laughs> so for. I don't know about a new meta-narrative. I think we need to, to really complicate the existing narrative, right? To really think about the complexity of interactions on the local and the personal level, and to understand the way that they fit with, you know, an existing narrative of, of Frenchness or of Latin identity that's being worked out at exactly this moment. Um, but I think rather than having a meta-narrative, to be able to keep the two in view at the same time, to sort of slide them on top of one another, and to understand that they are coexisting. Um, I mean, I, I would like to say something about, um, on the one hand, um, I think that uh, Brodel is, um, you know, continues to be useful for thinking about the Mediterranean even beyond the temporal um, moment that he um, w uh, was considering. But at the same time, I think that starting all um, histories of the Mediterranean from Brodel can be really limiting. Um, and at a certain point, I feel like there's lots of other conceptions of the Mediterranean that we might turn to that are not just Brodelian. And then the other thing I would say too is I've always thought of it as kind of an irony that here's this um, Frenchman who, uh, you know, spent uh, much of his um, 
um, adulthood, you know, thinking about the Mediterranean in Algeria, yet he sort of excludes France from the, the story that he's telling about the Mediterranean. Like he positions himself as an outsider to the Mediterranean and has this, you know, bird's eye view precisely because he feels like he's not of it. And so I've always thought about my, my work in a certain way as a repose to say, no, France actually is a Mediterranean country and continues to be a Mediterranean country to the present and that becoming a, a nation state didn't make that stop. Um, in fact, it's built upon um, it's a Mediterranean foundation in a lot of ways that we, we're not, we haven't been paying attention to. In fact, I think bec in partly because we've been so much adhering to his, uh, um, his account that excludes you know, modern nation states from the Mediterranean world. So I would agree with many of the things that have already been said just now by Elizabeth and Jillian. I guess I would add that, you know, I, I too find him still relevant in certain senses, right? The, this idea of the Mediterranean mattering um, and also kind of scaling between the city or the local, the state kind of in the background and the more global, right? And allowing us that, that vantage point is, is really useful. Um, what, one of the things that I do take issue with, however, is this idea of a northern invasion, right, which doesn't so much happen in the period that I study or in the kind of engagements that I look at. Um, and in terms of a kind of different model or different set of questions um, in themes. I mean, one of the things that I think really connects all of our work is the, is dealing with erasure, right? We're, we're all in one way or another um, dealing with erasure, and I think that connects to what you were saying about decolonial perspectives and, and decolonizing uh, early modernity, pre-modernity, right? Um, all of us are looking at how Muslims, uh, Muslim empires, Asia, have been written out of um, of these discussions, including the Mediterranean, including France, um, and the work that I'm, I'm currently doing and what was also inspiring for the work that I just finished is kind of really questioning what's wrong with the profession that we continue to erase certain people and certain parts of the world, even when we think about working on empire or working on colonies, right, or working on global topics. and. There are not that many of us, at least in the American Academy, who work uh, on, on the Mediterranean. So kind of really interrogating why those erasures are still there and trying to correct them is, I think, part of the larger story of working on the Mediterranean. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I completely agree with Junko. Um, I think this is a big project. I mean, you know, thinking our way beyond the Eurocentrism, um, and you know some of the some of the kind of racial assumptions and the kind of ways in which privilege, particular kinds of privilege and certain views, have shaped French history. That's a big project, and it's <laughs> ongoing, right? And and I mean I think there's a lot of work still to be done when it comes to the Mediterranean. Yeah, I mean, I agree with all my colleagues here that there are always things you can find in Bordel that are extremely useful, but the kind of, the totalizing conception is not very helpful. Yes, it included, it, it excluded France, but it also excluded the Muslim world in significant, especially Algeria, right? Because like, you know, I mean, it, it certainly excludes his own perspective as a, as a, a, a colon in Algeria, but, um, so I guess in my work I've tried to think more about Mediterraneans in the plural um, and I also feel that way about the way in which the Mediterranean model was transferred to the Atlantic. Um, I prefer to think about these different channels and that's why I like the Black Atlantic and the Red Atlantic and these ways of kind of disaggregating the Atlantic. Um, but there's a black Mediterranean and, you know, some, this is very new work. People like uh, 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 Shukri Al-Hamel, uh, he, he's written on black Morocco um, and so on. So, I mean, thinking, thinking these different paths of violence and coercion alongside exchange and trade and climate and so on, which, I mean, again, is so evident in this panel. I'm Craig. 
Democrats in East Chicago. Um, and I also, I work in the modern 20th century, so this is kind of an eye-opening. Um, and you kind of started answering my question with the last comment, but I'm just kind of, especially Jillian, your presentation made me think a lot about, I mean, this is important centering the Mediterranean, but really kind of the comparisons with the Atlantic. And I'm just wondering, what, how are they mutual, not, not opposed, but how are they mutually informing and constructing one another, um, both visually, which is really striking, but also kind of intellectually in the actors. And, and just like maybe just your thoughts on how and it, to what extent and in what ways visually, intellectually, or just through per human exchanges, the Atl Atlantic exchanges and networks, maybe West African, Central African, and the Mediterranean networks and are kind of, what's the, what the relation is really um, in constructing these different stories. And thanks again for a really great panel. Um, well, I'll take I'll take a stab at that uh, question. I mean, it's one that I'm still uh, you know thinking about a lot. I mean, certainly, um, what I argued in my first book, which is about French people taken um, to North Africa, uh, you know, as captives um, into 1830, was that you know conceptions of what it meant to be a slave uh, in France, which had earlier been um, you know some I argued. Um, uh, uh, that, 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 that ideas had, had come about within a Mediterranean context with the rise of the Atlantic slave system that sort of you know, racialized understanding of slavery sort of cast its shadow back on the Mediterranean and made it all the more untenable uh, for Europeans who were increasingly being thought of as white as opposed to as Christians to be enslaved. Um, but, I would, but, but going back to the 17th century even, I think that it is a really interesting period uh, as Junko already um, alluded to to where you know ideas about race are being worked out and there's a lot of things happening simultaneously but also it's a moment of where the the numbers of um uh, uh, French people enslaved in North Africa, the numbers of uh, North Africans enslaved in France, and the numbers of West Africans enslaved in the, in, in the Caribbean are, you know, on balance a little bit. And, um, and some of the same personnel who are, um, you know, figuring out the Côte d'Ivoire are also uh, figuring out how to, um, you know, maintain galley slaves um, on the Atlantic coasts of France um, and you know and sort of just trying to figure out how this all is going to work so it's um, in the case also I mean this isn't a huge number of people but some of these enslaved Muslims when they're worn out on the galleys are sent to the Caribbean so there's just like a lot of back and forth that I don't think we've really you know I haven't quite figured out how, you know how to, to think about it but I think there's a there's a material connection um, and I think there's an ideological connection too and I think the key really is in the, in the late 17th century. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say something? Or? Oh, that's all right. I think Sue has a question. Oh, go ahead. She had a question here. Uh, I would also point out the Indian Ocean and the Pacific, right? I mean, this, I mean, across this period, we do need to be thinking about, I mean, especially in, in terms of slavery and the multiple slave trades in which France is is engaged. I guess one of the problems of the Mediterranean could be, and I think your question is very important in this regard, is the, the way, and I would task myself with this, which is kind of reinforcing the metropolitan conception of France. Um, you know, because, you know, the Mediterranean is a kind of is a, an, a metropolitan, even though even though we've been thinking about particularly this relationship with these with these communities that are living in in the Ottoman world, we also have to be thinking beyond. And so, some of my recent work, I've been looking at the Comoros and, and uh, you know Africa and beyond. Uh, and I think that's actually really exciting to be engaging in. It's a big historiography to try to manage, but we have to keep pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zones, I think. And I think what Gillian said is absolutely right in terms of thinking those, those relations with the Caribbean too. So. Just to piggyback on what you're saying, I, I, I just add, um, in terms of what I'm working with my new project, um, which is on an Armenian prisoner um, from Constantinople, who was, um, it's, a, it's an example of early modern extraordinary rendition. It's like Guantanamo, basically, he was kidnapped and, and disappeared. And one of the things I'm trying to figure out with this 
guy who's basically taken to uh, the arsenal in in Marseille and then uh, to Mont Saint Michel um, and ultimately to the Bastille. But his servants are taken um, to uh, Guadeloupe, right? And so I'm looking at carceral spaces in this time period, and without really emphasizing France as the center, right? If we can talk about Marseille and the Caribbean and Guadeloupe and kind of these nodes um, that were becoming connected in France's larger global empire um, as a means to disconnect people, right? So kind of looking at the relationship between disconnection and connection while kind of zooming out um, and integrating Mediterranean, Indian Ocean, um, Caribbean. It's something I'm currently really interested in. Um, this is a very naive question, uh, I think, but I, I'm surprised, I guess, that I didn't hear much about Islam today. I didn't hear anything about tenets of Islam. I didn't hear anything about perceptions of Muslims, you know, Muslim subjectivity. And uh, so, yes, we're historians of France, and so that's, you know, we're interrogating the representations of, of the Islamic world. Um, but I wonder if, and to pick up on Junko's point, I mean, part of the limitations of the academy is is uh, language instruction in the United States. You know, most of us, I certainly don't have the capacity to do firsthand research in the Islamic world. Um, but I wonder if, if you guys want to talk about that. What st struck me as a silence or an eclipse or a shadow in, in your in your presentation today. I mean, I, I can start just from sort of the, the perspective of the work that I'm doing, um, sort of two ways. Right? It, has, it has consistently bothered me that I don't have, with the exception of this one strange case where I have Magdalena's voice at sort of second or third hand, that I don't, I don't have the perspective or the voices of the, these enslaved people. Right, which is very deliberate, right? They have been silenced and there is a, a denial of their personhood. And I don't think that the documentary evidence I have gets me anywhere close to the, the sheer number of enslaved people that I'm thinking of. I mean, the banality of slavery that comes out of the documents that I'm looking at suggests that there are enslaved people and they are very common and they are simply part of the topography, but I don't have access to them. And that is partially because I, I think the mentality of the system I'm looking at is really about dominance of religious enemies through ownership and through sexual coercion that explicitly denies the ex validity of their religion. Right? So you can have Muslims in France at a period I'm looking at, but they cannot practice Islam. Um, we have one burial in Montpellier from the 12th century and one in Marseille from the 13th that are possibly Muslim burials. Right? And otherwise, we don't have it. So Islam is always that thing over there, right? the thing that is from somewhere else. And not really very far during this period, right? I mean, the southern half of Iberia. But it is Muslims as, as bodies, Muslims as enemies that are at issue. In French texts from this period, willfully misunderstand Islam all the time, right? They accuse Muslims of being, um, polyg uh, being polytheists. They accuse them of being idol worshipers. They say that they venerate um, Apollo, right? There are all of these things. It, everybody knows it's not true, right? It's one more form of sort of rhetorical violence that denies the legitimacy of Islam philosophically. Because, of course, right? I mean, there has been regular contact between Muslims and Christians across the medieval period. But there is this very willful refusal to accord, in this kind of text, Islam, any kind of philosophical or theological basis that makes sense, right? I mean, theologians know perfectly well what the tenets of Islam are. But I think that that silencing is part of the process that I'm looking at. Uh, well, right before the panel, we were, we were talking about you know, our linguistic uh, capacities and limitations. And one of the things I was saying to Elizabeth was that you know, when, when I started graduate school, I really wanted to start, start Arabic. And my advisors were like, oh, that's crazy. You're never going to learn enough. There's no point. You know? And it's true that if for me to have really done the kind of research I would have liked to do, I would have needed to learn you know, Turkish and uh, Ottoman and, um, and Arabic. And, you know, and so on. So, I mean, but I do regret that, you know, I did take some Arabic during a sabbatical once, you know, and then, anyway, it's, it is very difficult. Um, but, but uh, you know, but the question uh, um, 
of, of voices and of Islam itself. I mean, in the period and the context that I've been studying, uh, I actually do have, um, you know, letters from Muslim galley slaves. Um, most of the ones I have are, the, are because they were intercepted by French authorities and then they were um, translated um, in, in the archives. And sometimes, in fact, it seems as if they were given uh, to people learning how to be translators to, to practice on, um, which is interesting in itself. But um, so, I mean, it's a super mediated kind of thing. But in my this book that um, Ethan uh, mentioned called the um, the money launderer's daughter. I am trying to. It's based on a, a rumor that was um, circulated by a Muslim galley slave, and so it um, that then leads us to understand the life of a Tunisian woman who herself never wrote a single thing, but we get to kind of find out more about her through the words of a Muslim galley slave that get refracted around the Mediterranean for a period of time. So I do think there's sort of creative ways that we can. Um, do better um, at trying to acknowledge, um, you know, the individuality and specificity um, of, of some of the people that we're writing about, even if we lack the languages and lack the, the same degree of um, archival base um, as we do for um, our, Euro our um, European, uh, you know, protagonists. Did you want to add anything? Well, I would, I mean, I, I encountered the same issue, right? I mean, I think we might have had the same advisors saying the same thing to us. <laughs> um, we went to graduate school we went together. To graduate school. <laughs> um, very regretful, right? Um, and the same kind of thing where I, I look at diplomats and consuls and merchants and things like that, right? People like that. But there are things in translation, right? And I'm also dealing with Armenian in translation and Georgian in translation. So it's kind of third degree, second, you know, third degree, fourth degree kind of layers of something having been translated from Persian to Armenian and then Armenian to French, right? So layers and layers um, there, but just even in translation um, to, 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 to articulate that there, these are sources that exist and, and we can engage with those is at least one door, I think. One of the interesting things that I, I, I look at when I was doing my um, readings on, on Nader Shah, though, right, and, and thinking about perceptions of Islam is how contradictory, especially with Enlightenment um, understandings of Islam, and, and especially the differences between Shia and, um, and and Sunni, and why, and this is all kind of French imaginings, right, w why one would make a better ally than another because this religion is more close to ours, or, you know, they think more universally, or what have you, um, but I never got a chance to look at, you know, again, the sources themselves that would, in the language, um, indicate anything other. Well, I, I actually did come to French history from Arabic. <laughs> That's what I was first studying. Um, and I left to go study Arabic in Syria and got stuck in India when September 11th happened and then decided that I actually wanted to go back to Australia and do my PhD because I suddenly saw that it was really important to me to talk about how people coexist, right? As as the Islamophobic rhetoric was was you know exploding all over the place and affecting Muslims that I knew very directly. And so in that sense that has been the kind of basis of all my project. Um, I have tried, and I think the most difficult thing I did in Muslims and Citizens was trying to think about both of these things at the same time and where they actually intersected. Um, and the, 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 the sources, I mean, we honestly looked as far as we possibly could I and and my student, who is a, a fluent, you know, he's a native Arabic speaker, um, looked for the sources and we found a few but but not so many really um and so there's a kind of there is a lack of sources and that is my limitations too i'm not going i mean for linguistic but also geopolitical reasons there are great difficulties going uh to find these these these, these, these sources at the same time, I guess the one thing I would say is the work that I think we've all done opens the space for people to bring their skills. So this student of mine who speaks fluent, I mean speaks Arabic as his mother tongue, also 
did a PhD in Sanskrit before he came to <laughs> work with me and he is now writing an extraordinary dissertation on uh, on, on, on revolutionary movements in India in which he's actually bringing his kind of philological insights into, into thinking about uses of fitna, for example, in, 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 in 18th century India. Um, it's really extraordinary work. So I hope this will contribute to actually opening up the profession so that, you know, it's not all about just your mastery of French and, you know, having been in the best, you know, US and French academies, but actually saying, you know, there are gaps that need to be filled and people have skills, right? Arabic is not considered to be a skill for French historians in France in particular, right? But it should be. <laughs> It should be seen as an absolutely crucial uh, skill that, that, that people bring to this work. Um, so, I'm just going to take the prerogative of the chair because we have about three minutes. Um, I just want to thank again our panelists, but I, I had a few sort of thoughts that, that I was trying to pull together and listen to the conversation. So first of all, I just want to say at the level of historical imagination, I think for modernists who have been boxed in by all the kind of binaries and blind spots and limitations that we talked about, this work is super important. I mean, for myself personally, I will say both Ian's work and Jillian's work were really important for me in writing about France as a Mediterranean space in the 20th century because what they had already started to do in other contexts with that. Um, so I think, and, and sometimes it's easier for both historians and other contemporary actors to get out of their own thinking by looking at spaces that feel less familiar. So I think at that level of historical imagination, it's really important. Um, I also just want to say, like, you know, we have this question about meta narratives. I think it's worth thinking about whether there are particular categories and patterns that we can chart unevenly across this history, categories of coercion, connectivity, control, construction. Sorry, I got a bit of a alliteration with my seeds here. Um, but uh, the, the point is, I think it's important also because of the question we asked about memory and erasures and prior meanings of certain things that, that we don't think about prior meanings for that go on in the contemporary world, that have prior meanings for the Islamic world and have prior meanings for other actors uh, in France and the Francophone world, and we don't know or think about those prior meanings if we can't try to come up with some sort of typology of certain things that have occurred across longer periods of history. Um, I don't think it's a naive question at all about Islam. Um, Ian and I were on a uh, we came up together at a conference like four years ago where I asked a similar question. Um, and I would just say, like, I, I think all of us in this room who are either you know, professors now or going to become professors, we have an opportunity to think differently about what the linguistic requirements for our students are. I mean, students who want to work on Muslims or Islam and French history, we have, we're in a position to say, okay, you must go learn Arabic. We also have a, the ability to think about what does global France really mean if we're thinking about global France? What are your linguistic requirements? And of course, I mean, it's easy for me to sit here and do it, and I, to say that my graduate students can go do the work and I have to help them find funding for it, but seriously, I mean, it, we have the power to help change what the expectations are around it. And I think um, that that's really worth uh, you know, us thinking about you know, how we can do that uh, together. Because I think, again, with the contemporary con conversations in mind, we're going to continue to hear about what Islam is and is not. And we're going to continue to hear about that from often people who are at least tinged with Islamophobia. And it's very hard to really be in those conversations if you do not have the linguistic skills, you do not have the skills to look at Islamic theology and contemporary Islamic writings. And so I think we want, if we want our students to be having that kind of impact, we want to equip them with those skills.